uh, who uh, our ancestors come from the motherland. And so I, I want to play this for you, uh, which is an excerpt from what she had to say. Then we're going to chat with it about our panel. I really think uh, you're going to be blown away about what she has to say. Go right ahead. We were way ahead of them in our civilization. They set out to destroy us. And Berlin Conference put the nail on that coffin. So they gave Djibouti the same sovereignty as the United States. They gave Burundi the same sovereignty as China. They gave Togo. You see, the EU realizes individual little countries, they can't survive on the world stage. So they come together as the European Union. Now picture this now. So they cut up this Africa into the tiny little countries, small economies that could never survive on their own, but gave them the same sovereignty as the big boys. So that way, when the little bitty countries go to the world stage for the purposes of development and discussing trade, they're wannabe boxers who are being thrown into the heavyweight boxing ring every day. How do you put China in the same boxing ring with Iswatini? Iswatini has 1.2 million people. China has 1.4 billion people. And you put them on the same stage and say, go at it, negotiate. Are you with me? Yes. This is insanity of the highest order. How have we allowed this carnage to go on? When Iswatini is thrown in the same boxing ring with China and Iswatini is collapses before Iswatini even gets on the stage, the world says, well, Iswatini, what's wrong with you? Why can't you take care of your people? Well, China came in and said, Iswatini, give me all your gold or else. And if Swatini does not agree, they just go on next door to Lesotho and give Lesotho an extra dollar. And if Lesotho doesn't take it, they just jump on to Togo, Central African Republic. It was all by design, 1884. They did something else in addition to chopping us up. They also set out to make the African believe that everything African was bad and undesir undesirable and everything Western, particularly French and British, was more desirable. We call that the legacy of colonization. Prior to that, they had started long working on the slaves. Make them think everything about them, forget anything about Africa. Where you come from is a horrible place, diseased and dying people, constantly at war with themselves, uncivilized. Cut out any communications with them. You need to just know what we tell you. And we call that the legacy of slavery. So that's why you look at where we are today. 135 years later, a system that was put in place to see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated, that Africa is forever exploited, remains in place today, alive and well. And we sit here and we ask yourselves, why isn't Africa moving forward? Why does Africa continue to be taken advantage of? Well, I'll tell you why, very simply. Until Africa comes together as a continent speaking with one voice, one continent, one people, nothing, and I repeat, nothing is gonna change. As individual little African countries, we are wannabe boxers. We will never make it fighting against the heavyweights. We must speak with one voice. Yeah. And this is exactly <laughs> This is exactly what our Pan-African leaders wanted to see happen in 1963 when they came together in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. They clearly stated that Africa for the Africans at home and abroad and that African Union was now. They said Africa must speak with one voice. It is the only way for Africa to take its rightful place on the world stage, sadly. 
When they went to Addis Ababa in 1963, they were divided. We had two factions, the Casablanca group and the Monrovia group. The Casablanca group were saying Africa for the Africans at home and abroad and African Union now. This was Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Only seven. The other 25 of the 32 who attended were the Monrovia group. They were the nationalists. They said, let's go slow. Let's kind of wait on this Pan-African thing. 55 years later, 56 this year, we're still going slow. As if it wasn't bad enough that we were divided up into the tiny little countries that we are today. The gift that Berlin Conference gave us. One other thing that France did between 1958 and 1961, in the name of giving us our independence as African countries. France forced the Francophone, and I hate that terminology. There is no such thing as Francophone, Anglophone. They made it up. But for the purposes of communication, I will use that. 14 of those countries, they said, in order for you to get your independence from us, you must sign this document. You thought they could have found a better name for the document. The document was called the Pact for the Continuation. I repeat, the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. We are talking about giving you independence, but sign this Pact for the Continuation of Colonization in a different format. And I'm going to highlight some of those issues that they said you must agree to if you are going to be independent. Hello. Maybe we need to redefine the meaning of independence for the French. First, France said, you see, you monkeys, you don't know how to manage your money. We're going to demand that you deposit 85% of your bank reserves with the French Minister of Finance. Under, rather, under the French Central Bank, under the control of the French Minister of Finance. France is then going to take your 85% bank deposits from each and every one of you. Deposit those funds in the French stock market under the French name. And you may or may not know the returns. Today, as we speak, the latest figures are saying for every 14 billion that France invests in the stock market from Africa, they are, they are realizing upwards of 300 billion in return. Every year, year in, year out, because of these deposits from the African countries, France is taking out of Africa over $500 billion. Now figure it out. For every 14 billion, the returns on the investment are over 300 billion, and they are taking over 500 billion. So in actuality, France is taking out of Africa trillions of dollars, year in and year out from us poor people, Africans. Back to the pact. So should you want to access some of your money that you have deposited with France, you have to submit your country's financial returns. And if approved, you get to get it as a loan. You can only access up to 20% of your money year in, year out, as a loan at commercial interest rates, your own money. As if that was not enough. They said all your minerals discovered, yet to be discovered, all your oil discovered, yet to be discovered, France and French companies have the first right of refusal. If there's anything left over that the French companies do not want, your people might have. To this day. They said you will only use the currency that we created for you because you're special Africans. We call it the SEFA. There was the Central African SEFA and the Western African SEFA, same animal. And that France is the only one that can print it for you. 
1958, fast forward, they're still printing it for us. And if you start misbehaving, they just stop printing your money. And your country's in trouble. <laughs> They also said your language of instruction shall be French, whether you like it or not. That France will have military presence in your country. That your military can only be trained by France. That you can only buy military equipment from France. That you cannot have any military alliance with your neighbor. And that in the event of war, your allegiance is only to France. And furthermore, because they have military presence in your country, they can invade you without notice should they feel that the interests of France in your country are being violated. Jesus, Jesus. Fast forward, 2019, nothing has changed. The same people who have the audacity to tell us that we are poor countries. <laughs> they are taking trillions out of Africa every year. And what is the African doing? Like an obedient, programmed black man, we just give in. We know the facts, but we just do nothing about it. Now, you have to say some of the fears are real because the France that has sold you inferior equipment to theirs, France that has trained your military to be inferior to their, to their military, they are now in your country. They can invade you. They have the permission to do so. They can destabilize you. And then one might say, why is it that African leaders haven't done anything about this deplorable situation? Well, let me tell you, my brother and sister, they have tried. Documented to this day, 22 coups where leaders were assassinated. France had something to do with it. The first seven, when they decided they were pulling out of the CFA and that they're going to print their own money, they were assassinated. Every time an African leader has tried to do what's best for their country, they were assassinated. Majority of them aided by France. It's a known fact. And then others, they were just mercenaries who felt that when there was a, a natural resource discovered in one country, they wanted to create a coup. So while the country is thrown into a civil war, they're siphoning the natural resource. We know of one particular story that had we not known about it, it would have been, oh, there we go again, the Africans. In uh, about 25 uh, years ago, a group of young, rich, white kids were having fun in Cape Town. They found out that there was oil in Equatorial Guinea that just been discovered, and they wanted it. So they set out a plan to have a coup in Equatorial Guinea. So while the Guineans are busy fighting a civil war, they will be siphoning the oil. But they made one mistake. There were two planes. One was to leave South Africa, stop in Zimbabwe, pick up more ammunition on their way to hunt in Equatorial Guinea. Another plane was taking off in the Caribbean that had this puppet diaspora who was supposed to be the next president. <laughs> Mugabe wondered why such young people needed such powerful ammunition to go hunt in Equatorial Guinea. In doing his research further, he found out that this was a coup in the making. He allowed them to land in Zimbabwe. They loaded their plane, and just before takeoff, they were all arrested. The ringleader of that group was none other than the son of the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher. She had to fly to Zimbabwe and paid handsomely to get her son out. The last one of those prisoners left Zimbabwe about six, seven years ago. Had these young people succeeded, it would have been another coup. There you go, the Africans again. Such, my brothers and sisters, is the story of your Africa. They don't do coups anymore. They simply create instability. So when you hear of an instability in an African country, ask yourself, what is really going on? Please.
Because what they are telling you is really going on is just a shiny object. The real issue is over here. And you need to stop before you start being used as an instrument of your own self-destruction. She's dead.